Hey y'all, my name is Mark Lindsay of Mark Lindsay CNC. This video is a companion piece to an article I wrote for my website some time back. And it's geared toward the person who is an absolute beginner at the home CNC hobby. Now, if you are a CNC beginner, you probably have a whole bunch of questions. Probably the best place to start would be with a basic understanding of what a CNC is and how the process works. Now, a CNC has become kind of a generic term used to describe several different types of equipment, like a CNC router, a CNC mill, a CNC lathe, a CNC plasma cutter, and to their enthusiasts, each one of those pieces of equipment has become generically known as the CNC. So for this video, I'm going to focus on the CNC router since that's the type of equipment that I am familiar with. So what is CNC? CNC stands for Computer Numerical Control. Now this means all of the physical movements of the router are controlled by a computer through a mathematical coordinate system. The computer moves the router or spindle along three different directions on the table or axes. These are the x-axis which is always from side to side as you face the machine, the y-axis which is from front to rear as you face the machine, and the z-axis which is up and down no matter which direction you're facing. Now for our purposes CNC technology has been around since the 1940s when analog computers used either perforated tape or a series of punch cards to send impulses to the machine to guide its movement. Now that system eventually gave way to electrical control, then electronic control, then gradually migrated to the digital system that we use today. The process that's used today by a home hobby CNCer is the same basic process that's used by huge manufacturing plants on big machines that can cost millions of dollars. These machines use specialized software which itself can cost up to several hundred thousand dollars. Now, while these machines and that software is so much more expensive, the process is basically the same. Now, the major parts of a CNC router can be broken down into several subcomponents. These include the bed or the table of the CNC, the gantry, which moves back and forth on that table and the z-axis which holds the router or spindle and its mount. A series of three or four stepper motors like this one here moves the various components around on a series of linear rails via a lead screw, ball screw, a drive belt, or a system of rack and pinion gears. My Gatton CNC uses a precision ground Acme lead screw that threads into a lead nut and as the motor turns that lead screw also turns and that nut with any assembly that may be attached to it moves back and forth along the length of this lead screw. All of the axes on this particular CNC have this lead screw. I have two, one on each side of the bed, that moves the gantry front to back. I have this one up here along the top that moves this assembly from side to side. Then inside this main assembly here is a third that raises and lowers the router or spindle. 
Also not visible in this shot is a desktop PC with monitor, keyboard, and mouse that are used to run the controller software. And more on that a little bit later on. Now please understand from the very beginning that the CNC router is not a miracle machine. The machine that can take materials in from one end and drop finished projects out the other end does not exist. No matter what tool or technology you use, there is always going to at least be some finish sanding, assembly, and finishing. A CNC router is no different. In addition to that, the CNC router is not always the best, fastest, or appropriate tool for the job. A CNC will not drill a hole faster than you can drill it with a hand drill or on a drill press. A CNC won't cut material faster than you can cut it on a table saw or a band saw. But where a CNC router really shines is in accuracy and repeatability. If you have a component that needs to have three dr holes drilled into it, a drill press or hand drill would probably be a better tool. If you have 32 holes to drill, each of a different size, and the sizes and locations of those holes are important, that's where a CNC really shines through. You can also make more than one of the same object and they will be virtually identical. So how does this process work? Well, in the home shop environment, the process is five steps that look something like this. Step one is the idea or concept stage. Step two is the design or CAD stage. Step three is the CAM stage. Step four is milling or machining. And step five is finishing and assembly. Some of these steps require computer software or special tools, while a lot of these steps require no special tools or software or even a computer of any type. Step one is the idea or concept stage. Basically, that can be boiled down to one simple question. What do you want to make? This concept or idea can be anything from just a mental image to a photograph or a sketch just drawn out on a piece of scratch paper. Some thought should be given to the purpose of the project. Uh, what material are you going to cut it out of? What about its general size and shape? Is it going to be outdoors or indoors? Is it going to be hung up on a wall and looked at from a distance? Or is it going to be held and used in your hands up close? So just generally, you should have an idea of what the finished project is going to look like and how it's going to be used. Step two is probably the most difficult step for the beginner, and that is getting the idea out of your head and into the computer. This can take many forms and several types of software can be used. If you already have experience with CAD software or computer graphics software, you're already ahead of the game. A CAD program like AutoCAD, DraftSight, NanoCAD, among others, can be used to draw the concept into the computer and the files saved from the CAD program can be imported into the CAM software. More on CAM in just a minute. The same can be said for many computer graphics programs. Adobe Illustrator, Corel Draw, Inkscape, and several other graphics programs are more than capable of exporting a drawing into a file type that can be used by the CAM software. My point here is that if you're already comfortable using a CAD or graphics program, you may be able to continue to use that in the CNC process and not have to worry about learning to use another new program. Step three is the CAM process. CAM stands for Computer Aided Manufacturing. This is the step where we take the design, 
and we assign various tools, router bits, end mills, etc. And we assign various types of machining operations, pocket cuts, profile cuts, V-carve, etc. We assign those tools and operations to specific elements of the design and then calculate what are known as tool paths. Tool paths are literally the paths the tools will follow in order to cut or carve the project. Whether that project involves cutting out something basic like a circle or something as complex as a 3D model. Once these tool paths have been calculated by the software, we can use them to generate and save the code that the CNC controller will use to physically guide the tool to cut the project. This code is called G code and it's used by the CNC controller software in step four. Now, there are several brands of CNC software on the market today that are known as CAD CAM packages. This means that you can draw the design, calculate the tool paths, then generate and save the G code all from within the same program, and that eliminates the need for a separate CAD or graphics program. Most of the so-called CNC software packages on the market today are this type. Some examples of this are Carveco Maker, Easel, Carbide Create, Vectrix VCarve, or Aspire, Autodesk Fusion 360, Autodesk Inventor, as well as several others. Step four is the milling or machining process. At this point, we physically mount a piece of material on the CNC router's bed or table. The G code we saved in the CAM process is loaded into our CNC controller software. The appropriate bit or end mill is put into the router or spindle. We set our zero points, turn everything on, and start running the code to cut the project. When it comes to the controller software, there are several options available. The most widely used is a program called Mach 3, but there are other options like Linux CNC, UC CNC, Universal G Code Sender, and several others. The controller is most usually run on a desktop PC that's dedicated to running the CNC controller software only. This is not always the case, though, as some CNC manufacturers run code from a flash drive through a proprietary pendant or handheld device. After the CNC is finished cutting the project, then we can move on to step five. Step five is the step that most of us are already familiar with and the step that's most related to any other form of home hobby woodworking. At this stage, we remove the piece from the CNC table, then we sand, assemble, and finish it. More time is usually devoted to this step than to any other, with the possible exception of step two. Now, while the CNC router can be very good at creating a piece, that piece very rarely comes off of the machine ready for finishing. There is almost always at least some finished sanding that needs to be done. Special sanding mops, wheels, and brushes and pads designed to be used on anything from a small rotary tool up to a drill press have been introduced to the market to make that job easier. And then finishing can be done in the same way any other woodworking project can be finished, whether it's oiled, stained and top coated, or painted. Now, a minute ago, I said that the CNC router isn't a miracle machine. It isn't. It's just a tool, just like any other tool in your shop. Some people think of the CNC router as a employee or helper who works for free where you could be assembling, sanding, or finishing one part while the CNC is cutting another part. And a lot of people do that, including me. 
Others use the CNC as a way of advancing their work into an area where they either don't have the knowledge or the skill set required, such as inlays or intricate carving. No matter what or how you think of a CNC, just know this, they are here to stay. The CNC hobby movement is a big one and growing every day. As the prices of these machines come down further and further, more and more people are able to afford them. Many factory built machines that once came with five digit price tags are now within reach of a home hobbyist who has a large workshop or a garage where they can park a machine that takes up a fraction of the size of your average pool table. Now, when it comes to selecting a CNC router, just know that sometimes there really is no best. Oh, there are options and opinions to be sure, but sometimes there is no best CNC router, there is no best router or spindle, there is no best tool or end mill, or there is no best size of machine. What I generally like to tell people is the best of anything is one you can afford, one that you're comfortable with, and one that does what you want it to do safely. So now hopefully you have at least a basic understanding of what the CNC process is. I know I didn't get into a lot of detail, but I have a full catalog of videos on my YouTube channel that will help you get into that detail. Now, it's easy to get lost in jargon, which is why I kind of try to keep it to a minimum. Do know that you will eventually have to learn some of that jargon because it's necessary for us to be able to communicate and know what one another is talking about. It's also easy to get overwhelmed with information. Information overload, as I call it, is probably the number one source of frustration for a person who's just getting started in this. And that's simply because there are just so many options out there. It's completely understandable. But do yourself a favor before you spend the first penny on anything. And that is sit down and take an honest assessment of what you want to use a CNC router for. Because each use has its own criteria. Yeah, it would be nice to be able to put a machine in your shop that's capable of cutting parts out of a full sheet of plywood all at once. It would be great to have something that would be a CNC router, as well as a laser, as well as a stone carver, as well as a plasma table. But each one of those processes has different criteria and has its own problems and challenges. Ask yourself, how often am I realistically going to do all of those things? And let that be your guide. If you are going to make cabinets, you may have the need for a machine big enough to hold a full sheet of plywood. But how often are you going to make cabinets? If that's going to be your business, you shouldn't be looking at a home hobby CNC router. You should be looking at an industrial CNC router that comes with one-on-one -on -one hands-on training. So, take an honest assessment of how you plan to use the CNC router. Ask yourself, what are you going to do with it? But answer it honestly and let that be your guide. So, to wrap this up, let me just end by saying that the technology has become so inexpensive that a machine that was once considered out of reach of the average citizen 
and only available to multi-million dollar corporations can now be put in your home workshop. If you have knowledge of tools, you can even build your own CNC router. There are plenty of kits out on the market right now that can take on several forms. Some of these may be a few structural parts that need to be put together and other parts and pieces sourced from other vendors or suppliers to complete rolling chassis with all of the electronic components that you just need to assemble. Some of these can be as cheap as a few hundred dollars and some can run up into the thousands. Just know that if you have a good working knowledge of tools, you can build a CNC router and put one in your shop. I know because I've done it. There is nothing magical. There is nothing mysterious. And there is nothing secret about putting a CNC router in your shop. I know because I've done it. And if I can do it, I know you can do it. So, I hope you got something out of this video. And if you did, I do hope you'll subscribe to my channel, give this video a thumbs up, and I hope to see you this afternoon for a live Q&A session that'll start at noon Pacific, 3 p.m. Eastern, right here on my YouTube channel. Now, I put a link to that live Q&A session down in the description box of this video. So I hope to see you there. And as always, whether you subscribe to my channel or not, I'd like to thank you very much for taking the time to watch. And y'all take care.